Life in the ancient world was never certain, and unsurprisingly, neither was death. Just because you were buried 60 feet below the desert sand did not mean your body was safe for the afterlife. The untold story of the changes in ancient Egyptian architecture would be the cat and mouse game between the robber and the tomb engineer. The evolution of burial sites from the very obvious pyramids to the completely incognito Valley of the Kings shows that eventually the pride of having the biggest pyramid was replaced with the self-preservation of keeping your mummy out of the hands of future robbers. Many early tombs were robbed, looted, and smashed up before anyone could document the security protocols that tomb had. However, one tomb and its ingenious robber traps survived for thousands of years, keeping its mummy safe deep underground. From marks outside the door, we know that robbers did try to get in, but that they failed. Today I'm going to tell you the story of the mechanics of that tomb, how it worked, how it kept the mummy safe, and it's one of the most ingenious stories from ancient times that I've ever heard. This is the kind of ingenious ancient puzzle that would have made for an excellent plot of an Indiana Jones movie. The best part of this story is that it isn't speculation or conjecture, it's actually true. The tomb was found intact and the mechanism to seal the sarcophagus and set the trap was still in place, so we know all the details. The tomb I'm talking about is located here, just east of the tomb of Dozier at Saqqara. These two shafts combine together to serve both as the location of the mummy and of the mechanism of the trap. The first thing the engineers did was to make two shafts 66 feet deep and link them at the bottom with a tunnel. Once the two shafts were completed, a large limestone tomb was placed at the bottom. Do not think of this tomb as a simple sarcophagus. It's rather a small room or little building with a roof that you could walk into. The entrance and exit was through the small tunnel linking the door to the next door shaft, the escape shaft. From the top, you would have two square shafts, one with the roof of a small tomb in it, the burial shaft, and one empty, the escape shaft, with a tunnel in the bottom connecting through to the burial shaft. At the bottom of the escape shaft, there is a tunnel connecting through the wall into the tomb on the other side, the burial shaft. The roof of the tomb in the burial shaft had three large circular holes in it, running from east to west at even distances. Fitted carefully into the holes of the stone lid were clay jars. The top of the clay jar was open, and the bottom protruded into the roof of the tomb. When archaeologists first entered this tomb, they found the bottom of these jars were intentionally smashed, a critical detail for understanding how it works later. From this point on, the true genius of the mechanism will be revealed, and I want you to think about this entire thing like one of those slide puzzles. Each piece of the puzzle has to slide in a particular order and be done correctly before the next part will work. The same thing occurs here. Each part had to be designed and executed in the correct order to effectively seal the mummy inside, lower the roof of the sarcophagus onto the mummy, set the trap, and allow the workers to escape. Here is how that would have worked once the shafts were dug and the sarcophagus was set inside and the roof of the burial chamber was placed with its three holes. The jars and the holes are currently intact and not smashed at this point. The lid of the sarcophagus was lifted up or never lowered completely in, allowing the empty space for the future mummy to be accessible. Remember, these tombs were usually completed before their owner's death and kept in a state of readiness to be used and the trap set at burial. While waiting for the funeral, the lid of the sarcophagus was propped up by four protruding nubs that sat upon four wooden posts fit into a groove. At the bottom of the post was a square tube the same size as the post and filled with sand, or perhaps a little larger. The tubes led to a smaller chamber under the sarcophagus. At the point in which the tube exited the small chamber, they were necked down and plugged up so they could be filled with sand from the top and the sand not escape at this point. Once the tubes were filled with sand, posts were placed on top of the sand and the lid of the sarcophagus rested on those posts, holding it up. At this point, the inner trap was ready and the only thing to do was to set the outer trap and wait for the owner to die and be buried. To set the outer trap, the entire large shaft was filled with sand 66 feet deep. The lowest point for the sand would now be those three little jars with their bottoms still intact protruding through the roof of the tomb. Now the only way into the tomb and to access the sarcophagus was the escape shaft next door via the tunnel. The trap was now fully set and only needed to be triggered. At some point, the owner of the tomb died and his mummified body was taken down the escape shaft through the tunnel leading into the burial shaft and inside the tomb. At this point, a single wrong move could have buried the workers placing the body, entombing them along with the mummy. A worker would have crawled under the sarcophagus and then blocked the ends of the square tubes. The neck down tube allowed sand to slowly trickle out, and as the sand lowered, so did the wooden posts holding the sarcophagus, and so then did the sarcophagus lid itself. The ingenious nature of this system for closing the sarcophagus lid 
tells me the engineers knew it would be possible to lower the 30 ton lid in that enclosed space with a small number of people that could fit inside that area. With the sand drain setup, a single person could put themselves in danger and start lowering the heavy lid. The workers then waited until the lid was closed before starting the next procedure. They smashed the bottoms of the three jars sticking down through the roof of the tomb and once again set in motion a sand drain that slowly filled the burial shaft. This being their final act, the workers then left the tomb via the tunnel connecting to the escape shaft, the name now being very apparent and fitting for their actions. Once they had climbed to the surface, the escape shaft was also filled and the burial shaft topped off with sand to blend its surface with the surrounding desert. And just like that, not only was one of the most spectacular funerary traps in ancient Egypt set, it was now totally hidden among the rest of the sand. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, when archaeologists finally set about opening it in the 1940s, they found that ancient robbers had actually discovered the escape shaft and dug down to the tunnel door, but they could get no further. Every time they dug sand out of the tunnel, it refilled itself from the massive column of sand housed in the burial shaft next door. According to the archaeological notes I read, it took 10 days for the team to dig the sand away using more modern digging methods and in no fear of discovery. The robbers would have had to empty both massive shafts to the last grain in order to access the mummy. The robbers did manage to get into several other graves nearby, smashing up the stones and obscuring any traps if there were any. It's possible those other graves were not buried with the same level of sophisticated trap, which is why they were eventually robbed. The only reason we completely understand this burial site is because it was found intact. If it too had been robbed, our understanding of just how clever these burials were would have been lost. The multidimensional thinking, the use of puzzles and logic with a clear sequency of steps to be taken in order is just astonishing. Now that we understand at least one method of lowering a heavy sarcophagus lid inside a tight tomb, we can look at other examples with clear eyes. I think that many people, including myself, previously saw these stone protrusions on lids and assumed they were for lowering the lid via ropes. I'm sure the nubs had had that purpose during transport, but the flat bottom and square edges seem best suited for a scenario like the one we just discussed, being supported on some sort of beam prior to being lowered. Take a look at these examples. Some protrusions are on the sides and some are on the ends. The unfortunate thing is that when one of these stone sarcophagi are removed from the original tomb and placed in a museum, the way in which the lid may have fit into the overall mechanism of the rest of the tomb is lost. Figuring out what the orientation was in the original tomb is now nearly impossible, if you can even pair it back to the original tomb in the first place. Fortunately, we do have some tombs with lids still in place like the Apis bull boxes of the Saqqara Serapium we can look at. I am not saying every box lid with protrusions is part of a complex sand mechanism, but we should remember that these boxes were made in advance of burial and held open by something during that time, and then they were lowered in a controlled manner to prevent smashing. Often, the lowering had to take place in an enclosed space like the Serapeum with little maneuvering room. We should remember the technology of the sand drain as an easy and effective means of setting a trap or lowering a heavy stone when we turn our questioning minds to the pyramids. No matter what the pyramids were initially used for, they certainly would have contained some insane traps built to protect them, but ultimately sprung by later intruders. There are four features of the Great Pyramid that have puzzled many people over the years, so why not add another idea into the mix? If we think of the Great Pyramid as having, at some point, been a place that needed to be protected from intrusion, then we should look around for the features of a security mechanism. The heavy stone portcullis is well known and other features have been proposed such as the sliding block that would have shut off the Grand Gallery. But what if there was something even simpler hidden in the Great Pyramid that makes everything else click into place? When it comes to the pyramid, we are all working with the same set of facts. However, the challenge is not to take those facts and make an even more complex theory to make it all make sense. The real challenge is to make a simpler theory. In my next video, I am going to tackle some of these mysterious features from the viewpoint of an ancient security feature, and I think you're going to like what I found. Remember, complex is not always more accurate.